Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm particularly uh, delighted to uh, have the draft uh, heads of the scheme of the legislation in relation to advanced health care directives, and I congratulate the Department of Health in having a consultation process in relation to the scheme of the bill, because it's extremely important uh, that the legislation is enacted with full input uh, of, of people's views on it. So I, I thought uh, Siobhan, uh, Siobhan O'Sullivan is going to talk about the detail of the legislation as the scheme as, as drafted by the department. And what I thought I would do um, was set out the context for that. Um, uh, Dr. To Toomey has given an indication as to say that obviously when we are making decisions about healthcare, uh, we need to give consent or we need to decide to tell our doctor we're refusing uh, a particular treatment. Uh, but in this jurisdiction, we have actually, um, particularly for people who lack capacity, we've all said what people want or whatever without focusing on the person themselves. So I just thought I'd start at the beginning, so to speak, um, and go through a few of the issues. Uh, we had a Wards of Court case in 1996 where the court at that stage um, referred to the Constitution of Ireland, which has been there, as you know, since the 1930s. Uh, and there are unenumerated personal rights uh, in Article 40 of the Constitution in relation to the right of self-determination, integrity and privacy. Uh, but we kind of ignored those. And the court said in 1986 that an individual with the capacity has the right to make decisions um, with regard to their care and treatment up to and including the right to refuse life-sustaining treatment, even if the refusal may result in their death. So at that stage, that wards of court case, that person was in a permanent vegetative state and hadn't made an advanced care directive. But the court went on to say, if she had, then of course uh, that would be followed. Um, we have had a number uh, of other um, international uh, situations. Sorry, just before going on to that, just to say the need for a legal framework. Dr. Toomey has said that. And again, coming back to where we are in reality, we have people, even where people are capable, asking family members to sign consent forms, which still have no legal validity at all in this jurisdiction. And when people, particularly older people, going into nursing homes or going into hospitals, they're spoken beyond, their family members are spoken to, they're, they're not spoken to directly. And again, when, of course, those people lack capacity, they're completely ignored, even though they may have some capacity to communicate and to participate in the decision that affects their lives. So we, we have a bad record, and culturally, we've grown up with this very paternalistic, and then we have all the family rows. One family member says, my mum wants this, or um, my aunt or uncle wants this, and another family says, oh no, she wouldn't like that. I had a friend recently, last year, who had a particular uh, medical episode, and she actually thankfully came through it and said she was aghast at her four adult children and her husband all rowing at about what her views were, which she said none of them reflected her wishes. So it's, that's, that's where we're living in at the moment. So we then have had over the years a number of international obligations and uh, Liam also mentioned the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Bill which is um, going through the Oireachtas at the moment. And uh, that uh, bill actually takes into account all the different international uh, conventions uh, that we have to comply with. We signed some of them in 2000, I'll go through, uh, two th we, we signed uh, the uh, uh, the UN Universal, uh, sorry, we f signed the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities in 2007, yet we can't ratify it. And the minister in um, publishing the bill said that we haven't modern capacity legislation, so hence we can't comply with our international obligations. So if we just look at the Council of Europe um, uh, recommendation concerning the legal protection of incapable adults, and I just thought I'd so just give some of the uh, very particular principles in some of these. Uh, that particular recommendation says that states should respect the dignity of each person as a human being. Uh, we have then the um, Hague Convention on International Protection of Adults, and that is to facilitate cooperation between states. So if I'm in France and I make an advanced healthcare directive or an enjoying power of attorney, what its uh, uh, force is here, is it applicable, can it be enforced by the courts? We have the European Convention on Human Rights, which Ireland actually um, incorporated into our legislation in 2003, uh, and we said that in any interpretation of our laws, we had to take account of the European Convention, which again spells out right to self-determination, right to privacy. 
And we all forget the right to privacy is not talking to our next of kin if we, the person doesn't want their next of kin to be consulted. So we ignore that uh, a lot. And then we have the <coughs> Universal uh, Declaration uh, on Bioethics and Human Rights. And what that says is that human dignity, human rights and fundamental free freedoms are to be fully respected. The autonomy of the person to make decisions is to be fully respected. And for persons who are not capable of exercising autonomy, special measures are to be taken to protect their rights and interests. I've already mentioned the UN Convention of Rights for Persons with Disabilities, which we, which we have signed, we cannot ratify, and we have modern capacity legislation. And basically, uh, what that convention is saying is that state parties have to reaffirm that a person with disabilities have the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. That state parties shall recognize that persons with disabilities enjoy equal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. In other words, the fact that you have a disability does not mean uh, that your rights under the law can be ignored. You have equal rights with all others. The fact that you have a disability must be accommodated, uh, but you just cannot be ignored, ignored. So very important. We then have the Council of Europe recommendation on principles concerning powers of attorney and advanced care directives, 2009. And what that is saying is that um, effectively the right of self-determination, the right to make an enduring power of attorney and an advanced health care directive has to take pre precedence over any other measures. In other words, in precedence over being made a ward of court currently or into a, a guardianship regime. So in other words, the right of the person when they're capable the right of self-determination and autonomy. And then we have, very recently, the Council of Europe recommendation on the promotion of human rights of older people, which actually was only um, uh, adopted uh, a week ago. And basically that is concentration, as you see, on older people, but it's repeating some of the same points. The state parties reaffirm that persons with disabilities have the right to recognize everywhere persons before the law. Um, and that uh, older people shall have the right to respect of their inherent dignity and member states should provide for legislation which allows older people to regulate their affairs in the event that they are unable to express their um, instructions at a later stage. So all the emphasis is on the right of the person to decide and the right of the person to decide when they have capacity as to what happens when they lack capacity. So that's extremely important. Uh, so, um, the uh, advanced healthcare directives are going to be uh, incorporated, as Dr. Toomey says, into the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Bill. Um, and while we have a presumption of capacity in this jurisdiction under the common law, we've no legislation spelling out that a person has to be presumed to have cap capacity unless the contrary is clearly shown. So the legislation will spell that principle out because as I gave the illustration of older people or whatever being ignored, now the legislation is quite clearly saying that there is that presumption of capacity and there is an obligation on all of us to actually talk to the person, find out what their wishes are insofar as they have the capacity to articulate their wishes. That bill also sets out a number of uh, detailed principles. So it repeats actually um, the principles set out in the various international conventions and also the constitution. So the right uh, of um, uh, due regard to respect the right of a person to his or her dignity, bodily integrity, privacy and autonomy. And of course bod bodily integrity is all about uh, intervention in relation to health care. So I I extremely important principle set out in, in, in the legislation. Uh, will and preferences of the individual uh, are, are to be based on the person's own beliefs and values. Again, coming back to um, Again, the international conventions demanding if we ratify this, we have to give due regard to the will and preferences of an individual. Uh, there will be an obligation on everybody to endeavour to maximise a person's decision-making capacity. We have a situation at the moment, our legislation on wards of court is 1871. And um, when, when I've said this in, in other jurisdictions, they're saying, are you saying 1971? I'm saying no, 1871. And our thinking and our process under that legislation is at 1871. So we have a lot of catch up to do. And basically what that legislation is, if they find that you have capacity, lack capacity in one regard, you're deemed to lack capacity to make any decisions. So under the new legislation, it will recognize that people have different levels of capacity. And uh, there will be an obligation, as I say, on everybody to maximize whatever the capacity the person has. 
Um, and even where you're deemed to lack capacity, still the conversation uh, at the best time of the day to talk, etc., uh, must be availed of. Any intervention must be the least restrictive of a person's rights and freedoms. Uh, again, terribly important. Now, moving on then, the advanced healthcare directives. Uh, so that's the background into the capacity legislation that this, uh, the heads in relation, or the, the, the principles in relation to advanced healthcare directives will be. And uh, again, the definition as spelt out in the legislation, and Siobhan will be dealing with this in more detail, is that uh, an advanced healthcare directive means an advanced written expression of will and preferences, the will and preferences copying the UN Convention made by a person with capacity concerning treatment decisions that may arise in the event that a person subsequently loses capacity. And the fundamental point made already is made by a person with capacity to be put into effect only when the person lacks capacity. So the purpose of the legislation then is to promote the autonomy of the persons in relation to their treatment choices, uh, to enable persons to be treated uh, according to their will and preferences, beliefs and values. If I'm a Jehovah Witness and I refuse blood, that's my right to refuse blood. And the High Court has said that uh, in a number of decisions. So the fact that medically it may not be the best uh, idea, it may be a very unwise decision on my part, I have the right, if I have capacity, uh, to make that decision and to plan uh, in advance, if I lack capacity, that my wish is carried out. Uh, to provide healthcare professionals with important information about uh, persons and their choices in relation to treatment. Um, and then uh, in, in this particular section of the bill, uh, there will be additional principles, including the right to refuse treatment on any grounds. So um, it can be religious grounds, it can be just, uh, that's my view, that's my value system, or, or whatever. Just going back then to look at the situation with regard to consent to medical treatment. Uh, there is the right of autonomy, uh, a person has the right to decide at the moment, which is very often as ignored as I've already said. But in consenting and refusing treatment, it must be on the basis of informed consent. So um, the person must understand uh, what they're consenting to and freely give their consent, so they can't be forced into making that decision. And it must be informed consent for both refusal and consent. And then coming back to the capacity element of that is that there's the presumption of capacity unless the country has shown that, again, mixed in with informed consent and the understanding and the capacity is to understand the information relevant to the decision. Again, here, in terms of ward or court, you might be asked, who's the president of Ireland? What day of the year it is? Nothing got to do with your capacity to understand the information in relation to the decision you have to make. And we, at the moment, are making decisions based on that very elementary kind of status approach to the capacity. So it's the new legislation will be a functional approach, which is issue-specific and time-specific. So you're being assessed on the particular decision you have to make. Have you capacity to understand that, to understand the information, to process that information, uh, to make the decision? and to understand the reasonable foreseeable consequences, the risks of the choices you make, uh, and if you fail to make a decision, if you refuse treatment, <coughs> do you understand that you may die if you refuse treatment? And interesting, that FK case, the Jehovah Witness case, uh, 2007 in the High Court, um, where again the hospital made the application on the basis that the lady in question refused uh, blood because she was a Jehovah Witness. And the court in actually recognizing her right to refuse treatment on religious ground, the first question the court said had to be asked was, had this lady capacity? Did she understand that if she actually didn't have a blood transfusion, there was a high probability that she would die? And the court decided she didn't have the capacity, she didn't recognize uh, the consequences of this. So if I lack decision-making capacity at the moment, who makes the decisions on my behalf? Um, a person can decide in, in advance, and as Dr. Toomey has already said, that these are currently recognised. But there's huge confusion. So if I go to the doctor and give him my advanced healthcare directive, he's kind of looking at me to say, well, what's this? What's the status of this? Etc. 
uh, there is that the case law, the decisions of the Irish court, I've referred to the wards of court, and then the FK case, the Jehovah Witness case. And there have been other decisions as well, and in, indeed in other jurisdictions. So a full recognition of the right of the person to decide. And of course, in many cases, it's only the really very hard case that goes to court. And many decisions are made on the ground, ignoring uh, th that whole issue uh, of the person's right to decide. We have also, thankfully, uh, since 2009, the Medical uh, Council guidelines in relation to advanced care directives. That was after the work the Law Reform Commission uh, did. And we have the HSE consent policy of last year, which again is equally very good, which sets out all of these issues. So in practice now, in the last few years, we have a full recognition of that right of a person to decide, but we have no legal framework. Um, Currently also we have a situation where an application can be made to court and, and uh, uh, a number of, of applications have been made. We have a, a, prov a provision uh, under the 1996 Enduring Powers of Attorney legislation where a person can appoint an attorney for their uh, property and affairs uh, issues and for their personal care, which is where I live or whatever, but nothing in relation to health care. And uh, obviously the Enduring Powers of Attorney legislation is going to be updated and again brought within the uh, provisions of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity legislation. So going forward then, if I lack decision making capacity and we have this, this new legislation, so who's going to make the healthcare decisions uh, on my behalf? So um, we have, first of all, the Assisted Decision Making Bill sets out I have the presumption of capacity in legislation. Uh, it recognises there are different levels of capacity, so uh, I, I've mentioned that already, uh, and provides that a, a person's will and preferences must be respected. So in other words, uh, all of those are set in the, the light of the new capacity legislation. In relation to advanced health care directives themselves, a person can set out their wishes in advance. It will be legally binding, <coughs> it must be valid and applicable, and Chafal will deal with the detail of that as to what it means by being legally binding, what is legally binding, what is valid and what will be applicable. Uh, so we will have clarity um, and legal certainty in relation to that. Um, and uh, very importantly, the legislation, of course, can only set out the very high level uh, issues and principles. We badly, very badly need a detailed code of practice explaining the detail of that. Uh, and Siobhan will go, some, go through some of those points. So that code of practice is going to be critical. And a code of practice, again, coming back to the assisted decision making bill, we'll have a public guardian whose function will be to publish and have and consult with other bodies in relation to codes of practice. So codes of practice, not only for advanced health care directors, but codes of practice for people who may be mentally ill have had advanced care directors. Code of practice if you have a stroke. So for different categories of people, that code of practice or codes of practice are going to be extremely important. Under again, under the new legislation, we, have a, we will have a situation that a person can nominate uh, someone else to act. So that, in the current legislation, the terminology used is a patient-designated healthcare representative. So a person can nominate somebody to either, as Dr. Toomey said, interpret their wishes or actually make the decisions on their behalf up to and including the refusal of life-sustaining treatment. We will also have the expanded enjoying powers of attorney legislation, which will also include uh, making a healthcare attorney. So that's important. So we'll have two uh, opportunities. Uh, as you probably know, the formalities for an enjoying power of attorney um, are more complex, if I can put it that way, uh, rather than, uh, than making it an, um, a, uh, appointing a person to be a healthcare representative. And we will still have the court. Under the new legislation, there will be particularly a particular specified circumstances where it is necessary in terms of whether an advanced healthcare directive is, is valid or for particular categories of people. Um, and again, we still have a situation where there's no advanced care directive in place, where people haven't planned ahead, haven't their advanced care directive, and what's to happen then in, in particular circumstances. Um, again, as already uh, stated and to emphasize, uh, the new legislation will not affect the current criminal law on euthanasia and assisted suicide. Um, and uh, just to say that basic care cannot be included in an advanced care directive. So normal uh, hydration, nutrition, shelter, warmth will be regarded, will include uh, basic care. Again, the code of practice will say uh, what is basic care. 
Um, so the legislation will provide you cannot refuse basic care. So just if I can conclude then to say I've spoken a lot about the rights, but along with rights comes duties and responsibilities. So uh, certainly the international research and research here has indicated that where people actually plan ahead and enter into these arrangements, uh, have an enduring power of attorney, or have a, an advanced health care directive, there's a lot less stress and distress uh, for people, for the person themselves and at the end of life for, um, for their families. Bereavement is much smoother, the, the conversations take place, everybody knows, there's no family rows as to what they thought my mother or father wanted or whatever. It's all set out there and the person themselves have indicated and are comfortable uh, with their decisions. And when they're planned in advance, even if family members disagree, um, they accept uh, if they're set out uh, as, the, as, as the person's wishes. I have struck in, in the last few days where, uh, you know, people asking questions, well, what if the family disagree with this? And I'm saying, well, this is a legally binding agreement by the person who made it. Uh, so healthcare professionals, family members, everybody must recognise this is a legally binding agreement um, or, uh, or directive. So um, just in terms of the Think Ahead um, tool that Sharon was mentioning earlier, earlier uh, so it's necessary to think about these things and to plan, to talk about them, and to communicate and write down uh, against one's wishes and preferences. And the Think Ahead form is a great tool which is being actually updated uh, and will be updated um, in the next month or so. So it's, it's a very useful tool um, to form. So I'd be delighted to answer questions later if, if necessary. Thank you very much indeed.